Okay, we will continue with our notas. So put down, uh, let's see, actually it's just kind of a continuation of where we left off. I think we, well, we were talking about the history, weren't we? And we were talking about some of the background information <coughs> on the New Testament. So there's a couple of things I want to kind of uh, close up there, if you will, and then we're going to, and then we're going to talk about inspiration. Okay. <coughs> Remember when we, we finished, I think last time, we were talking about religious developments, and so we, we discussed the different groups that were developed at that time, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Essenes and so forth. And I mentioned how <clears throat> that the Jews had become, um, what's the word, disenchanted maybe, with the temple. Okay, so the priesthood uh, became corrupt, The uh, a lot of hypocrisy going on. If you, if you have the sons of Eli doing their things at the temple gate and um, taking their uh, lion's share of the meat and all of that. And so they were, uh, it kind of discredited the priesthood as a whole. And Eli really didn't do anything about it. He was just displeased with it. So as a result, because of the hypocrisy and because of all the things that were going on, and because of the captivity, the synagogue became more prominent. And so we could say this phrase then, the temple was for religious worship, and the synagogue was for religious instruction. I don't know if I gave that to you last time, so I may have. So the temple then, and this is a phrase that kind of sums up sums thing, uh, those things up. The temple was for religious worship, and the synagogue was for religious instruction. Which do you suppose is more influential, worship or instruction, and why? Why do you think that? Instruction, because instruction teaches you how to worship. Okay, good, yeah, good. That's a good point, actually. Surprised. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Anything else? That's, that's a good point. It's a good thought. It's a thought. So you have instruction, you have worship. So I suppose you have to find what worship is. What is it? I mean, what does it involve? How do you know somebody's worshiping? They're praising whoever they're, well, we would worship God, so we were praising God. So you were saying praise is a part of worship. Okay, I would agree with that. So, how do you know somebody's praising? How, how do you go up to somebody saying, wow, that, that person's worshiping? What do they do that, that clues you into that? You never thought about this before. <laughs> um, the things that they're saying and their actions. Actions, right? Okay, so it's some kind of outward show, is what we do, right? Some kind of outward show, which praise is certainly a big part of that. Prayer, if somebody's praying, are they worshiping? Yeah, I think so. And that's an outward sign. So <clears throat> when we voice our praise, it doesn't have to be necessarily in public, but it's something that we do. When we read the Bible, there are actions. Um, and the actions are a result of instruction. That certainly is true. However, your instruction uh, becomes that which is... Um, y your worship may be what you've seen. Okay, So somebody gave you an example of worship and you would follow that. But the instruction backs that worship. So if you've got... Okay, let's say you, you grew up in a, in a religious home, right? And so you, you followed what your parents maybe did. Um, and maybe they went to church, okay? Maybe they prayed. Maybe they, I don't know, if you grew up in a Jewish, it doesn't have to be Christianity, right? If you grew up in a Jewish home, maybe they uh, celebrated Hanukkah, okay? Or maybe something like that. But if they never gave you the reasons for that, and if they gave, never gave you the instruction, they never gave you the backing for it, what it normally ends up happening from generation to generation? You end up losing that worship, okay, because you don't know why. And so instruction tells you why. Instruction tells you, um, you know, for what reason, and it gives you authority. Now, in our case, of course, when that instruction comes from the scriptures, that is the authority which backs that instruction and helps to enforce that. So. Is it important to place God's stamp of approval on worship? I think it's exceedingly important. I think it is one of the utmost important things. Uh, because if, you're, if you don't instill in somebody this idea that there's a higher authority that we're following, then it just becomes tradition. Right? It just becomes what you do. It just becomes motions. Ceremonial. Right? It just becomes, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, outward show. Uh, yeah, right, that. So... Uh, instruction is very important. It's very important. And we, we shouldn't uh, downplay this idea. Is, is it possible, even in a good, strong church, <clears throat> that people would follow? Okay, have you ever heard somebody say, well, my church says this. 
or my preacher says this, right? That only goes so far. Uh, and with other people, really, what do they care what your preacher says if they're not part? It's not, it doesn't matter. But what who is, is God is overall. So we, we have that instruction. Now, if we say God says this from his word, well, that has the ultimate authority behind it. So this idea of instruction. So you can see why if we understand the difference between worship and instruction, we can understand how the synagogue became such a prominent place in the, in the, in the lives of Jewish people and not worship. So in, in the time of the New Testament, uh, the synagogue then became uh, very similar to the church. In fact, if we were to look at the synagogue service, it's very similar to the church. And so it, it, became, it became more because it's localized, right? So what are some of the similarities between synagogue, synagogue and the church? I mean, why do I bring this up? Because we're talking about the New Testament. New Testament has the, the idea of a church. So they, it's local. The temple is certainly local, but it's one place. And what, we, what we mean by local is it's in each place. So as opposed to being universal, it's more local. Was, uh, was Judaism uh, a universal sort of uh, theocracy? Was it... Was it a, uh, like a state church? It was, wasn't it? That's exactly what Judaism was. But the synagogue had the kind of the seed or the germ of what the church would be. And so it was the beginning of it. Um, now, one more thing about the preparation of, uh, of the coming of Christ. We did mention uh, the religious part, the history. And then let's talk a little bit about language. Uh, in particular, the Greek language, because that is the language that the Lord uh, chose to give us the New Testament in. It is going to be hard for somebody that's never studied Greek to really have a full understanding of what I'm saying. When you do, you understand it more fully. But the Greek language is very, very developed. If I had to say, I guess if I had to signify, it, it's, it's a very, very developed language. In other words, in its written form, there is very little room for um, opinion. There's very little room for it, is, it says what it says, and if you understand the grammar, you can't really mess up what it says, okay? You can't really guess. It is what it is. And so because it's so developed and because it's so exact, you can say. Now, I'm not saying that, there isn't, um, that, that in some instances there isn't an exact English counterpart to what the Greek says. So we're not really talking about translation, okay? Again, what I'm telling you is a little bit hard to maybe for you to get to, get, to grasp, but... Not that you can, it's just you're not, you, you're not, you don't have a whole, a, I don't know, maybe you do, but maybe not a lot of experience in it. But when you translate from one thing to another, sometimes what is lost in the translation is that in the language you're translating to, there isn't an exact equivalent in whatever language you start with, okay? So um, some languages are close, and so it can be pretty close. Other languages are not. So if you're going from Hebrew to English, for example, th those are radically different languages, I would say. And uh, you, those who are in Hebrew with me, you know what I'm saying. It's totally different. And so to go from, and when we start translating, you'll see this a little bit more. There isn't all, all the time an exact translation. So I'm not saying that there isn't, I'm not really talking about translating. I'm just talking about if we were all speaking Greek here and we didn't know English, which is kind of a bizarre thought. But if that were the case, then what we're saying and the, the, what we're trying to convey to you in, in the Greek mind and not thinking English, again, which is hard to, to grasp, very exact phrases, lots of words, lots of exact words for it. Where English might use one word to mean a bunch of different things, and Greek uses different words for all those things and because it has shades of meaning. Not only that, but things that modify uh, your, you have, okay, in, in uh, English, how many definite articles are there? What are they? Okay, uh, the, the, not the indefinite articles, just the definite article. Indefinite articles, a and an. The. There's one. In Greek, there are 24. So it's a lot more developed, okay? <laughs> yeah, there's no question. In, in, in English, I always say the is used for anything. The, 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 the. It's just all the. Uh, but in Greek, there's 24 of them. So you, you can't, it's not like you don't know what they're talking about. Follow? Okay, so it's very, very, very developed. It's very exact. <clears throat> And then I think we looked at the history of Macedonia. Did we look at that in this class where we looked at? No, it wasn't in this class. But even how, how the Greek language came about through Alexander the Great is a very interesting history. You don't have time right now to develop all of that. But uh, suffice to say that it, is, it was a major contributor to many things. And you know more Greek than what you think, just like you know more Hebrew than what you think. 
just because English borrows things from, the, from, from these languages, okay? Um, things that you say and you think to yourself, I didn't know that was Hebrew. For example, you ever heard yada, 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 yada. You heard that when people say blah, blah, blah. That's Hebrew, well, if you know that. It means I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> Isn't that funny? <laughs> but no, uh, the names, some of your names, a lot of your names are Hebrew names. Definitely Abraham, that's a Hebrew name, okay? A lot of your names are Esther, that's a Hebrew name. It's so your names, you're named Hebrew people, believe it or not. Pam, I don't think it is, neither is my name, but <laughs> Levi, yeah, okay, so Rebecca, definitely. So, um, if you are Christian, right, that, that's a lot of times what happens. At any rate, God chose this language on purpose. He could have chosen a, a number of different languages, and when you study the history of Macedonia, if you get a chance maybe sometime, it's pretty interesting because it was, that was a country that was on the verge of complete extinction. And in just two generations, it, it, it ended up conquering the known world at that time. In two generations, really amazing thing. So, uh, and that was the language that was disseminated. So we, and, and by the, so, and also, yeah, I'll just say this. Greek is the, is the reason why we know Egyptian hieroglyphs. So how people know how to read that. It was through the Rosetta Stone. But it has to do with Coptic Greek. I'm not going to go into all of that. But I'll just say this, that it, it, has, it has become a language, certainly, more than just um, a religious language. It's, it's become very uh, linguistic, even scientific. <clears throat> but God chose this language to give us his word in. Right? So um, we have the system of worship uh, became more synagogue-ish. I just invented that word, as opposed to temple-ish. Right? Then uh, the Greek language, the language that God gave to us also... The roads that went through Palestine. I know I talked about that. All the different armies that built roads through there. This was necessary for uh, God's plans later on because this was having all the Cicero roads well established and having synagogues in all these lo locations spread uh, the gospel very quickly. The Bible says that the gospel was uh, given out into all the world at that time, the whole entire world. So everybody in the first century had a chance to accept uh, Christ, and now they rejected him. And so then we, so their generations following, of course, would suffer from that. Now, uh, having said that about how we receive the Bible, let's talk a little bit about uh, biblical inspiration. So that's going to be our next topic. Or uh, I say, yeah, next, I guess. Well, let's talk about inspiration. The more I um, I don't know, really think about this and look at inspiration from all the different uh, angles, the more I'm amazed that we have the Bible. The more I'm convinced that it is preserved for us by God himself and not by man. Uh, because, because we have it. Uh, just think of it this way. If in, the, if in the first century, if Satan would have had his way, um, we would not have the New Testament. And if we didn't have the New Testament, then you would have no idea that there was a man named Jesus Christ that lived on this earth. You have no clue. No clue at all. It is only because of the preservation of the Bible that we even know that he existed at all. Nobody's ever seen him. Right? People, in your life is like a vapor. So was his physical life, in, in a sense. And so he was here for a short time, and it vanished away. Um, so unless books are written about you and about me, which they're not, <laughs> maybe they will one day, we will pretty much be vanished away. It was like we were never even here. Um, but the Bible has preserved for us these things. So God <clears throat> has inspired this, his word. We believe that it is inspired and it would not have been written if it wasn't God directed. That's maybe a good way of saying it. If God hadn't directed it, there would be not one word written in the Bible. And he preserved it. Very important. Uh, lots of different ideas about this. Okay, your critical text people will tell you that the, we, and I'll get into a little bit of this in a minute, but we don't, we don't have God's word. We have some of God's word. Or, or they'll say we have what's close to God's word. Okay, or the Bible contains God's word. Right, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, we don't believe that. I don't believe the Bible. I know the Bible doesn't teach that. And people that believe that way, I think, um, I don't know what the, if they just don't understand or if they just refuse to understand because they want to sell their Bibles. I don't know exactly what the motivation is. But the Bible is very clear. So let's look at some verses of, uh, uh, of inspiration. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It should be very familiar. 2 Timothy 3. Okay, so that says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's a very... Uh, Interesting Greek word there, and I'm going to kind of 
the inspiration of God. Okay, so <coughs> it is okay. This is um, theopneustos, and this comes from two Greek words: theos, which means God, and neustos, which means breathe. So, what does theopneustos mean? God breathe. Okay, so this is what, what we get inspiration from. Whenever God breathes in the Bible, life is a result of this. So he breathed into Adam, into his nostrils, the breath of life. And life became, and man became a living soul. Uh, the scriptures are alive, okay, according to Hebrews 4.12, isn't it? They is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So whenever God breathes something, and that life is a result of it. Uh, why is life a result of it? Because in him is life. Now, life was the light of man. So when he created something and breathed out the words of creation, life was a result of it because it was inside him. Only God is that way. But he, we see it through the Bible. We see it through creation. We see that it's really a reflection of who God is because it came from him. So uh, we continue. 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is, so we have the results. That one phrase really is, a lot is contained in that. And it says, and it's profitable as a result for doctrine. What is doctrine? It's a, that's a, it's really a word that means something very simple, but it's come to be, it's come to be uh, applied to theology. But it's just teaching. That's all it is. So it's good for teaching. All right? uh, teaching is very, very important. We talked about instruction. We talked about the synagogue. Uh, doctrine and teaching is very important. If you're called to be in the ministry in some way, really, the ministry is a ministry of teaching ultimately, is what it is. So all of you, hopefully, will be teachers in some regard. You say, well, uh, you're a lady here. I get married, I'm just going to follow my husband. But if you're in a church, you will probably, I, I, I almost guarantee it, you will teach, especially if they know you've been to Bible college. You will have a teacher business, and you should want that. Okay, it's, it's an important thing. So it's, so it's profitable. We, we know that we can teach this and not have to worry about it because it's God-breathed. So whenever I teach something here, it's truth. That's where, uh, yeah, so... It's profitable for doctrine and then for reproof. What is reproof? To show somebody that they're wrong, essentially. So you show them, okay, no, that's not right. It's not right because the Bible says this, reproof. For correction, now that's um, a little more in-depth there. And then instruction in righteousness. So it tells you how to live. It tells you why. And it tells you the, the correct way. It tells, it tells you when you're wrong. It tells you the right way, all of these things. And so that's because it is inspiration of God. Why, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, Complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So if you're to teach, and if you don't teach from the Bible, your teaching is imperfect. Okay, it only is only perfected when we backed it by the Bible. That's why you have to be very careful that when you say something, don't just say it, back it up with scripture, and this way it is perfected or complete. So uh, we're talking about inspiration. God breathed, theapnustas. Okay, so although the gospel, the gospel writers and the writers of the Bible were inspired, in other words, they were God breathed into them this knowledge and understanding. It doesn't mean that they were without error. They were sinners, okay, like we are. But God used them. He used that he was they were an instrument in his hands, just like anybody would be. It did not make them the smartest men on earth. In fact, a lot of what they wrote down, they didn't understand it. Remember Daniel? He said he, he wrote those things down, and then he asked the angel, What do these things mean? Is it would be kind of like me writing a sentence on the board that came from I don't know, I wrote it down there myself, and I had no idea what it, meant, what it meant. I wasn't copying, I was writing it down. That wasn't the case, it was just, this was inspiration. Um, doesn't mean they were necessarily more intelligent. It doesn't mean they were sinless by any means. Who are some of the authors of the Bible books? Solomon? <laughs> How many wives did he have again? Okay, he, he was, it was very immoral, wasn't it? David even, same thing. Peter, Peter messed up. He, he, he denied the Lord three times. Uh, David, somebody that had somebody killed and committed immorality. But yet God used them to write the Bible. God cannot but, if, if, if God decides to use man to write the Bible, he cannot but use sinners, because all men are sinners. Okay. Um, now, here's what, here's the, now let's talk a little bit, that's, that's inspiration. Let's talk about the nature of inspiration. In other words, exactly what do we mean by inspiration? Okay, we're going to have to define this. Okay, what we mean is this. People say, um, or, or the, 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 I say the nature of the Bible, the nature of inspiration. 
What does that mean about this whole Bible? It means a number of things. Number one, it means some of the parts of the Bible are God's exact words. Okay? Now this is nature, in other words, the way he inspired it, some of the Bible are his exact words. I'm not saying that some of the Bible is inspired. It's all inspired, but some of them are inspired in such a way that we have his exact words written down and uh, nothing else. In Exodus 24, 12, <coughs> there it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, what did he say? Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that thou mayest teach them. So here we have an example of God's exact words. It says, And the Lord said to Moses. It didn't say that the Lord said, through Moses, it said he said to him. So here are the exact words of God. This is exactly the way he said it to Moses. We have it here. So a lot of the Bible are his exact words. Some of the Bible are God's words put into the writer's mouth. Okay, um, we, So they, it, it comes out through the, through the writer. Okay, so it's kind of like, it would be like you, me telling you, okay, Go and tell them this, all right? and, and I try to explain it to you, but the way that you'll tell whoever I said to tell this, them this may be slightly different. They get to convey the message. It's still uh, God's words, and he still has put a stamp of approval on it. Some of, the part, some of the Bibles are the words of the writers. The Lord allows the writers themselves to write their own words down. It is still inspired because he still puts a stamp of approval on it, but he allows that. So even though some of our exact words, some of the words of the writers, some of the words of the writers given that, that message or through them, yet all of it, because God puts his stamp of approval on it, according to 2 Timothy 3.16, all of it is inspired. Okay, this would include the New Testament, of course. All right, now, theories of inspiration. What are some of the theories? All right, so we say this, we have God's word. All of his words are here in the Bible. How are they uh, what are the theories? How did it come about? Okay, well, some people would say that the Bible was inspired, but that inspiration was natural inspiration. In other words, the authors of the Bible were inspired. Very much like you will be inspired one day to write a book about, I don't know, whatever you like, okay? Your college New Testament survey teacher. All right, that's what you're... All right, maybe not. But, but you're, th there is natural inspiration. We would say maybe... Um, that uh, some, some famous books, some infamous books, were written by the inspiration. Some people were inspired to do this, and it comes from in themselves. Okay? They were inspired. Um, the Communist Manifesto is a very, in my eyes, a very infamous book, yet he was inspired to write that, I would say. Um, the, uh, what else? I don't know. Uh, there, are, there have been books that have been very influential for, in, in positive ways. There are... Um, Coaches that have written some books that I've read that they were inspired to do it. They're not authors necessarily, but something inside them told them, encouraged them, and inspired them to write those things down. So are, is, is the Bible then a collection of books that these authors were inspired in and of themselves to give us? No. Okay. Then another theory of inspiration is thought inspiration. Okay, this says that the thoughts of the Bible are inspired. What is the problem with that? Is there a problem with that? Yes or no, and if so, why? Yes, because then you can just rearrange the words because it's just a thought, it's not exact words. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh -huh. That negates the fact that, it, that the words themselves were inspired. All right, so can people put thoughts down in different ways? Yes. And so in order to, but God wanted his thoughts conveyed in, a, in, a, in, a, in his exact way. So, that's thought inspiration. Thirdly, partial inspiration. <clears throat> Excuse me. Partial inspiration says the Bible contains the Word of God. Have you ever heard of juicy juice? You heard of that? It says it contains 100% juice. Yes. What does that mean? How much of that thing is 100%? In other words, they put in there 100% juice, but how much of it is 100% juice? Who knows, right? And so... Um, just kind of a tricky uh, marketing tool, maybe. But, that's, but the, the, you don't market the Bible. It's not partial inspiration. It doesn't mean that it contains the Word of God. It is the Word of God. It's different. All right. Then there's a the theory of mechanical inspiration. 
that God just grabbed the writer's hand and, and did this number, okay, and allowed them to, they could have even been sleeping and <laughs> they're writing away or whatever. All right, this is mechanical inspiration, a very, I don't know what the word might be. So the, the writers were just machines. They were robots in God's hands. No allowance for the style of the writers, no allowance for any of those things. Okay, so if all of these things are not inspiration, then we have to define very exactly what it is. It's kind of like um, what a church might put before Baptist. We are premillennial, fundamental, blah, 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 all these things, right? Because they're trying to make, be exactly what they are. So we have to define what inspiration is. And I suppose it could be defined in, in two ways, classically speaking, or these are kind of theological terms maybe. But we're going to call it plenary verbal inspiration. Mm -hmm. Isn't that fancy? What is plenary verbal? What is verbal? What does that mean? What's a, what is it? <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah, okay, uh, yes, could be. Um, yeah, words, okay, words. It was funny, my, my, uh, my wife was, was talking about verbal abuse the other day, and I said, I know what that is, and she said, what? It's like, when you look at someone, you go, run, fight, talk. You're abusing them with verbs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I mean, it could be abusive. That's horrible. So, uh, or it's like when, when the, my kids wake up and, and they're, they just, like, they're still half asleep and I abuse them with verbs. I go, tell me your name. What's my name? What's your mom's name? What's your telephone number? Where's your address? And <laughs> I remember I did that with Andrew one time and I said, what's your name? He goes, Michael. I go, no, what's your name? Michael. <laughs> I said it like 10 times and he couldn't get out of his head. <laughs> no, you're not Michael. Okay, so verbal. And then plenary means all the way through. So all the books of the Bible, all the way through. You see, we have to define this. See, this should be enough. The words of God are inspired. But we have to add this thing because we have to do away with partial inspiration. So, right? The Bible doesn't contain the words of God. All the way, it is the words of God. So here we have to put these, all these words in there to be theologically exact in our definition of inspiration. It is plenary verbal. Book of John says, sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. Simple statement. So this could be a definition of the Bible. What's the definition of the Bible? Truth. A simple one word definition. All right. Now, this is the whole Bible, of course. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about the New Testament. <clears throat> okay. Um, the New Testament uh, was written, of course, in the first century. And the, the Lord himself, when he was here on earth, designated for us who, was who were going to be the ones that he was going to choose to bring God's word. One of the reasons he had apostles was because he was, in, he was going to empower them. In uh, John 14, he said, It is expedient for you that I go. Because if I, if I go not, if I don't go, the, whole, the comforter shall not come unto you. <coughs> he will uh, cause you to remember, essentially, he says, all things whatsoever I have said unto you. So what he's saying there is he's telling the apostles, okay, you're going to be the ones who later on are going to come and you're going to record for the, wor for the world the words that I spoke when you were here. So he designated them. And he said that God's Spirit is going to cause you to remember all of those things. And you're going to write them down. So God said, Jesus said, okay, you, you people are going to be the one. And it's his words. He says, whatsoever words I have commanded you. And of course, the book of Hebrews says that God, who in sundry, manner and diverse, sundry times and diverse manners, before gave us his word through the prophets, hath this day given to us his word through his Son. How? Because Jesus said those words. He sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit then um, guided the New Testament writers to give us the word. So that was the chain of inspiration. That's how God did it. Uh, let's take the book of Revelation, for example. The book of Revelation has God who gave his word to an angel, who gave it to John, who gave it to the churches. Right? This, is, this is the path of inspiration for the book of Revelation. Uh, but essentially, God's word is given to these apostle people with that apostolic gift who were designated, and it was given to the churches. You do know the whole New Testament is really is written to the churches, is given to the churches. 
All right, so uh, this is inspiration. God did it in diverse ways, different manners. Here we have an angel kind of in, in between there. Uh, and then John and the churches, uh, sometimes in different ways. But he designated those people that had the apostolic gift, you, if, you, if you will. And so why, why were there signs in the New Testament? Why, were, why was there speaking in tongues and all of it? Well, t the end of the book of Mark tells us it is because they, that he, they gave, these apostles gave them God's word with signs following. So that's why I called the signs of the apostles in the book of Acts, because these signs were to tell the Jewish people, okay, these words that these people are saying are authenticated by these signs. So that's what, that was the reason for the signs. It wasn't so that we can have a second blessing and all this, this idea of you know, the Pentecostal mindset. It was because for that first century, and was for the time that God's word is given. So at 1 Corinthians 13, Paul tells us that tongues shall, when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away, the signs. Right, so we have that understanding. Um, so th that's, that's inspiration. We, uh, so all the New Testament books then were given to us by those that had the gift of, if you will, the apostolic gift. And these were certain men that Jesus chose himself to bring us and give us God's word. Uh, and it is also interesting that in the time period that the New Testament was given to us, 22 of the 27 books of the New Testament were written between A.D. 45 about and A.D. 70. 22 of them. Some were written before, some were written after. But 22 out of 27, I didn't look at the percentage, but it's a very high percentage of them were written in a very short period of time. Was that 25 years? 30 years. 25? What did I say, 70? 25 years. So, uh, now if you consider the fact that the Old Testament, 39 books were written in a thousand year period. So you have 39 books written in a thousand year period compared to 22 out of the 27, 22 books written in a 25 year period. That average is pretty close to just over a year per book. That was in a very short period of time that was given to us. Levi, were you going to say something? Oh, uh, A.D. 45 to 70. Okay, the New Testament Gospels. All right, now the, what, what kind of, uh, now let's just talk about the Gospels in particular. This part of the New Testament. The Gospels then give us not so much a biography. It, it is a biography, I suppose you could say, of Christ. But it gives us more of a, more of a personality, maybe. It reveals to us what kind of person he was. And more than just giving us details about his life, it is written in such a way where we understand a different aspect of his life. So the book of Matthew, we're going to get to this in a minute, but let me just mention it now. Um, I'll just give you for example. In the book of Matthew, Christ is seen as the coming king. It was written to the Jewish people. So the aspect or the picture that we get of Christ is him of, uh, as the coming king. In the book of Matthew, the book of Mark, it has a different aspect of it. But taken all together, we see uh, a person, a personality, a very unique personality, a personality that's unparalleled. Nobody like our Lord uh, Jesus Christ ever and ever will be. He is extremely unique. And that is why in John 3.16, uh, there it says, For God so loved the world, He gave His only, what does it say there? Begotten Son. He has only one begotten Son. God has many sons. Only one begotten Son. By the way, the critical text takes out the word begotten, incidentally. So there it says, um, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What, was Jesus Christ God's only son? No, he has many sons. But was Jesus Christ his only begotten son? So does the word begotten matter? Yes, it makes Jesus Christ extremely unique. Take that away and you, and you destroy the doctrine of Christ. So, um, so he's the only begotten son. I don't know where I was going with that one. Oh, yes. So the New Testament, then the Gospels, and, uh, and the Epistles together, which are letters, both kind of give us a picture of a person, really. The New Testament is Christ. First, the biography gives us who he was, his personality. He was prophet, priest, king. He was uh, all of these things. And then uh, the Epistles tie, tie it in together because it explains him. It explains his teaching. It explains why. So maybe the Gospels would be what? And then the epistles would be why, would answer that question. Okay, any questions? Too busy writing. 
Okay, uh, then let's take each of the Gospels one at a time now. All right, so let's we'll look at the Gospels and we'll look at some details of those Gospels. All right, we'll, we'll take the book of Matthew. Okay, a good way to probably exemplify uh, what I'm going to say is that it's kind of like if you give... Uh, if you, if, you t if you take a picture of somebody from all four sides, from the front, from the back, from the sides, right? If they just, I think people say that they have a, a better photogenic side. I don't know if that's true or not. And they have a smile that they put on only for pictures. They don't ever smile that way. A lot of times I'll look at a picture and I'll think, you don't ever smile that way. What are you doing? But that's their picture smile. And so uh, they're trying to maybe portray somebody that they're not. I don't know what the deal is there, but you might take a picture of the front and of the back. You can tell whether somebody has hair back there or not. I won't go any further than that. And then from the sides. But anyway, you get a fuller picture of that person when, when they're or a picture taken from, from all angles. If you can understand that, which I think is easy enough to understand, we can understand why there are four Gospels. Overall, it gives us a fuller picture of who Christ was. All right, so, book of Matthew. Matthew... The author is also called Levi, Luke 5.27. And after these things, he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. So, Matthew was a publican. It, all, it says in the book of Matthew that he calls himself a tax collector. So a publican uh, and a tax collector are synonymous. This is somebody that collected taxes. All right? So he did it, somebody working for the Roman government that would collect taxes for the Roman government and for himself. And that's where the gray area was. So if, they, if, they, if the people felt like they collected an inordinate amount of taxes for themselves, then uh, when it wasn't necessary, this is why they're hated. Okay? So it's going to be kind of like, uh, it would be kind of like, for Haven Baptist College requires every class that you pay $1. And whatever else I can make off of you, I put in my pocket. So I'll charge you three dollars. <laughs> I'll put two dollars here and one dollar to the college, right? So now I'm going to live in a beautiful mansion, all that, and you're having to pay me. You probably wouldn't be real happy about that. You probably wouldn't be. You probably wouldn't invite me over for dinner, right? I wouldn't be on the housetop in the chief seats. None of that. Um, so if you can understand that, you can understand what what the deal is here. Why why they were why they were so hated? Well, Matthew was one of them. It's almost like the Lord says, okay, I'm going to take this person that is hated and I'm going to make him a gospel writer. Remarkable. In a lot of ways, the people that God uses in the Bible is an encouragement to me because they weren't this incredibly intelligent or physically dominant personalities. They were tax collectors. They were publicans. They were simple people. So Christ is seen as the king of the Jews. He was their king. As a result, the book of Matthew is very Jewish nature. <clears throat> the recipients were everybody. I don't like to say one recipient enti entirely. Really, the, the whole New Testament is for everybody. But it, is, uh, it gives that aspect of him being the coming Jewish king. Okay, so uh, the triumphal entry is very important in the book of Matthew. Uh, in fact, you can look at it uh, in that way, it's just him as the coming king. Very, very Jewish. It, it, it links um, the the ministry of John the Baptist and how it links that with the book of Malachi and the Old Testament. Lots of Old Testament references in the book of Matthew. And so uh, lots of quotes from the Old Testament. And that would make sense. So he's the coming king in Matthew. So that's one aspect we get. Then the book of Mark. Now who is this John Mark? Oh, well, it turns out um, that he was somebody that, uh, who followed... Christ, but ended up fleeing from him at the crucifixion. A lot of people believe in Mark 14, or it is believed, verse, verse 50 to 52, that there it says, And they all forsook him and fled, and there followed him a certain young man, having a linen cloth cast about his naked body, and the young man laid hold on him, and he left the linen cloth and fled, fled from them naked. It believes, it's believed, because this is the book of Mark, that he's speaking of himself. So he was a follower of the Lord and fled from him, and we see John Mark coming to prominence actually in the epistles. 
he was um, nephew to Barnabas. Remember the son of consolation. Barnabas, Hebrew there, son of Nabas, son of consolation. And uh, he, John Mark was his nephew. The church uh, in the, the church of uh, Colossae, I believe, the Colossians, it, they met in his house, in his mom's house, John Mark's mother's house. Okay, so it was in, in that house that that church met. John Mark uh, began to, uh, was on Paul's first missionary journey and then ended up fleeing. He ended up quitting, if you remember. Uh, after he quit, however, we see later on in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that Paul says, uh, speaking to Luke, I believe, he says, bring John Mark with, you know, speaking to Timothy, bring John Mark with you and for he is profitably for the ministry. So he was not profitable, obviously, in the beginning because he fled from him. So much so that that became a point of contention between Paul and Barnabas in the second missionary journey. So they split. And Barnabas went with Silas and Paul. Excuse me. Paul went with Silas and Barnabas went with John Mark. This was John Mark. The reason why John Mark, that, that Paul didn't want to is because he left him. He forsook him in his first journey when they needed him. And, but then later on, it becomes profitable for him. So that's the journey sometimes that is taken. What we can see about John Mark is he got back up again, didn't he? Like what was preached Sunday night. He fell. He messed up. But he got back up again. And he kept going. So if you learn from your mistakes, then it was worth it. If you don't, then it wasn't. And you're going to make a mistake. So am I. We will. It's part of life. But you just reel back from it. You go through what you need to go through. You go through feeling bad. You beat yourself up. But then you get back up again. Christ then, in the book of Mark, is seen as a suffering servant. He chose this man. He chose John Mark. Somebody had gone through that cycle, somebody that fell, got back up again, to give the aspect of, of the Lord Jesus from uh, the, the point of view of a servant. <clears throat> In fact, a suffering servant. This would, um, would help the world, really, I suppose the world, yeah, the world, to understand that the Messiah was to be a suffering servant. We have the servant passages in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 42, for example, when he talks of, of the Messiah and he mentions him as being a servant. So one of the things the Jews would have known about the Messiah is that he was a servant. All right, so the book of Mark then is replete with lots of servant passages. And that's why it's very fast, very uh, straightway immediately. It's a very prominent word in the book of Mark. Youth, uh, euthos in, uh, in Greek, this means immediately or straightway. So Mark is, is the servant. It's, it's a gospel of deeds. It has the Lord performing a lot of things and lots of acts and things. And that's, uh, so it gives that aspect. So we have the aspect of him being a king. We also have the aspect of him being a servant. Very much what the book of Isaiah <coughs> portrays for us as the Messiah. Um, that he was a servant, wasn't he? He also is the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace in, in Isaiah. In the book of Zechariah, he is the coming king. Zechariah 14, placing his feet on Jerusalem when he comes again and the mountain being split into four pieces. So the Old Testament gives a picture of Messiah as a servant and as a king. So we see this in both the Gospels. Let's move on to the Gospel of Luke. Well, I guess I... That's an R. Is there not? And then Luke. All right, the Gospel of Luke. Luke, let's talk a little bit about him as an author. He was... The beloved physician, according to Colossians 4.14. Luke was a doctor. He was an educated man. He was, probably grew up in a wealthy home back then, undoubtedly, unless there was some kind of special favor. Only rich people went to school. Those parents apparently were old, were old enough, were uh, rich enough to be able to send him to school. And he was one of Paul's travel companions. We see that in the book of Acts. In fact, he wrote the book of Acts. Uh, that book, uh, coupled with the book of Luke, kind of gives is, is a little more filled and a little more replete with uh, hist historical references. And so apparently Luke was a historian as well as a doctor. And so he was a Renaissance man, if you will. Uh, lots, of different, uh, asp lots of different things that he looked into. He must have liked traveling a lot. Um, a lot of the books are, are, or his books talk about travels, about the Lord's travels. So this is the author of the book of Luke. Christ is seen then, uh, the theme, as in his humanity. So we see the humanity of Christ brought out perhaps more in the book of Luke. He is the Son of Man, Luke 19.10. We 
says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. All right, so he's seen as the Son of Man. Um, all right, so it is the, you know, that, what's Luke 11.35 say? Shortest verse in the Bible? Jesus wept. Very good, okay. Keeping you awake, very good. Yeah, so this shows his humanity. He wept. He was sad, obviously. Um, he, he had, he's, I thirst, right? Okay, so a lot of the human aspects of Christ is brought out there. So we have these fourfold picture. We have king of the Jews. Um, and then we have um, a servant. And we have the son of man. Because okay, so he was human. All right, then the book of John. All right, what's that final aspect of the life of our Lord that the Lord decided to give to us? Is not only was he the coming king, not only was he certain, not only was he human, he was also divine. He was God. So here he is uh, the God-man. Here's the son of man. Here's the God-man. So his divinity. It's the gospel of divinity. So we have a full, you could not have a full picture of Christ unless, you, unless there was a book that dealt with his divinity. <coughs> Excuse me. So he's seen as the Son of God. It is in uh, the book of John where we have the, the clearest picture of that. Uh, Philip said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Um, and so uh, lots of these references. Is it important to understand that Jesus was God to even be saved, have an understanding? Yes, I think you have to know that Jesus is God. Okay, if he was not God, then what was he? The Jehovah's Witnesses would get you to think that he was just a human being. Perhaps a, a good one, a good person, but it was just a human being. What's the problem with that? First of all, it's not biblical. But secondly, if he wasn't God, then what was he? If he was a man, what does that make Christ? A sinner. And if he's a sinner, how can a sinner die for somebody else's sins? So it completely destroys... The Jehovah's, that's why the other day I, was, I knocked on the door of Jehovah's Witnesses. And I, I have to admit, it gets, it gets to me a little bit because it's heresy. And I told them at the end of that, I said, you're preaching heresy. You're teaching heresy because Christ, you're making Christ as a man. If, the, if so, then, then there is no salvation in Christ. It's gone. And of course, they try to uplift the name of Jehovah. But what they're really doing is pushing down the name of Jesus Christ. And so that is, that is a terrible heretical uh, People. It, is, it is not even Christianity. I mean, how can they be called Christians if they don't even understand the doctrine of Christ? No question about it. Jesus Christ was, was, was the coming God. And you say, why is there Father and Son and all that? And they try to get all that. The truth of the matter is they refuse to accept the person of Christ. Um, so, <clears throat> he, is, he is the God-man. So it is the gospel of divinity. So as a whole, the four gospels then give us a fuller picture of who the Savior was. An amazing person. Do you suppose that he knew that he was the king of the Jews? Did he know that he was the coming king of Israel? Sure he knew it. And yet he was willing to gird about his and wash somebody's feet? It's amazing to me. I, I'm no king of anything. I'd, be, I'd have a hard time doing that. <laughs> and I'm, the, I'm not king of anything. Um, he wasn't afraid to, to take on flesh. Okay, if you were... Think of this. Think, think of uh, Christ... Humility. Nobody has been humble. Nobody humbled. I don't know if it's been humble is the right term, but nobody humbled himself as much as Jesus Christ did. Simply because here he was, God himself, creator, creator of the entire universe, angels adoring him, worshiping him. He's in heaven. He is God. And, and, he, and he became born in a, in, a, in a smelly stable. Not only that, they, that he allowed people to make fun of him, spit on him, uh, put these things in his teeth, he allowed all of this. Never reacted uh, adversely to it. And then he allowed them to put them to death on the cross, his very creation. That, that's a degree of humbling that we didn't, we'll never know that. Because how high was he and how low was he? He was far higher than we, infinitely higher than we will ever be. You know what? He was a lot lower than we ever even care to be. That's the humility of Christ. But we see it, it's brought out in the book of, of, book of Luke and we see a fuller picture of it. Through all of us. And so um, the fact that he's the coming king of Israel is one thing, but the fact that he is God of the universe and the coming king of Israel, and yet a servant, 
and yet willing to take on flesh. I don't think that when we get to heaven one day and we're given that body, that we're going to want to take on a body like this ever again. But he did it. An amazing person. We, we, we can appreciate him all the more having these different aspects. And so, um, now let's look a little bit about, uh, or look into uh, what some people try to classify these Gospels. Right. Uh, so let's, let's kind of divide up these Gospels. Nah, I say we, the way that they are at times sectioned or divided. Uh, the book of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they say are synoptic Gospels. Okay, what does that mean? What, well, again, here we go. It's a, this is together, and this comes from the Greek word orao, which is to see. We get ophthalmology from that word. And anyway, uh, syn, S-Y-N, is a, the prefix meaning together. <coughs> Excuse me. So synoptic simply means something along the lines of seeing together or, or being of the same viewpoint. All right, so they say, people say, that these three Gospels were, um, are so, so similar, which right there I disagree with them, they're not that similar. But they are so similar, and they deal with very, a lot of the same things, that maybe there's another document that these three books were written from. That other document has the original information. They read those things and they came up with their biography, was the idea. And they give the, the document a... Uh, Surreal name. They call it Q. The document is Q. Where does Q come from? It comes from the, from the German word for well, which I think is quell. So it's a well. In other words, this is the well that they got all their information from. You can see the, what they're trying to get out there. Now, where is this Q? Oh, we don't know. But obviously, looking at these three Gospels and how similar they are, there must have been a document somewhere. Well, where is it? Well, we don't know. That's just what it is. So you see, so what, what's the problem with this? This completely destroys the doctrine of inspiration. To say that <clears throat> the Gospel books were inspired means that God placed them the way that they are, okay? And, and uh, no, not more, not less. And that it was God's purpose to give us four accounts as opposed to one. As opposed to one Q that they would say perhaps is inspired somewhere uh, we have from, from where these three come from. Okay, I have a serious problem with that. Again, this destroys the doctrine of, of, of inspiration. Instead, so here again, your critical people, the rationalists, quote unquote, would, would try to get you to see very much that there's another document that we don't have. And so then they can base their assumptions on something that we don't have. And you can't prove it because you don't have it. For example, the book of Corinthians. There's, they, they have a, they believe there's a lost letter. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, or excuse me, Proto-Corinthian letter. That supposedly there's a letter that the Church of Corinth wrote to Paul, and that um, we don't have it. Okay, so then if we don't have it, then we, there, you know, there's, there's a problem with that, because we would believe that all of uh, God's Word is inspired, and we have all of it that He wants us to have. And so... They will always get you to see there's another document somewhere that they can't, nobody can prove whether it really existed or not. But they take uh, tenuous and really very, uh, not very sound arguments to, uh, to back that. So it's all assumptions. Um, but this is where, where you have to, we have to be careful with this. I, I suppose that even though, I, you know, there's no, there's no such thing as this, okay? We believe that these three books are given to exactly the same way. Well, then, how would you account for the fact that these three Gospels speak of similar things? Similar things, but yet different. All right, so what do I mean by that? Okay, for example, the, the history of the maniac of Gadara. You remember that? Where the Lord sailed across the Sea of Galilee. And there met him a maniac, a person that was possessed of demons. Well, in some of the Gospels, it says there were two of them. Two men. In other Gospels, it says it's just one. So right there, uh, if you're, if it just depends on what your presupposition is, how you go into the. It's just like looking at bones, right? If you believe that there was a creator, you're going to look at bones differently than somebody that believes it was evolution. So how, what's going to color the way you look at it? Your presupposition. I assume the creation was true. Therefore, I'm going to 
look at this in a certain way. I assume evolution is true, right? Well, if you assume that we have all the Bible and that all of it is, uh, is preserved for us and we have, we have it, and we've always had it, just like you said we always would, then you're going to look at the fact that there are three Gospels that talk about very similar things and try to, to get, you're going to look at it a certain way. And then if you believe that there's, we don't really believe in inspiration, you believe that there's this cue that they all had gotten from, then, then you can account maybe for this. Well, the problem is this one says there was two maniacs and this one says there was one. The cue really says it. We don't really know. Okay, Q says it. But these two say this. So what happens if they just messed it up? Somewhere from here to here, somebody messed it up. And they said it was two when it was really one. This is one that was really two. On the other hand, you could uh, look at it and say to yourself, okay, this one does have two. This one has one. The Lord must have had a reason for that. And then you start to look at it from that point of view. And when you do that, the Gospels become rich in information. It opens up the understanding to so many more things. So this really dumbs down what the Gospels are really trying to teach. Knowing that these three Gospels are placed there and the differences are there on purpose gives us a fuller understanding. You see what I mean? It helps us with it. Um, okay, for example, the feeding of the 5,000. We have, we have that miracle. Uh, and some of the teachings. Well, that miracle, some different details are given to us in other Gospels that are not given to us in, in some of them. What does that mean? It means that the aspect that, that, that God is trying to bring out through that uh, the writer was simply not necessary maybe to have that information. We also know that, so certain details are added by the Gospels. Um, also, in, in the Lord's teaching, many times he was teaching the same teaching at different times. That could very well be possible. And so the reason why it's different is because he taught in a different way. If you ever taught the same lesson to a different, okay, if you taught a Sunday school or whatever, and have you taught the same lesson twice? Sometimes preach the same sermon here and then maybe at another church. You're not going to preach it exactly the same way, but it's going to be the same kind of sermon. So if I gave you, if I gave you a set of notes and I, I got up here and preached the sermon, then I gave it to David. He got up here and preached the sermon. It's the same notes, but it's not going to come out the same way. Okay? because there are different times. Understanding that, we can understand it. And in fact, um, trying to answer the question why the Lord might have had these differences really brings out more truth. So there's no really problem. There's no real problem with the, with, there is no synopsis problem in my, in my mind. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, now let's begin to talk about Christ's life. I know I have chalk here somewhere. Where did I put that? Ah. Okay, four. Any questions on any of this? Any questions on the synoptic, the issue here, and what the issue is? Do you understand what the issue is? Do you understand why they're not right? Do you understand that really it's all your presupposition? Um, for people that say there's actually other books that are, are not, like, written by other apostles were not in the scriptures. Uh -huh. How do you refute that? You're saying um, that the apostles wrote other books themselves? Yeah, other apostles apart from Oh, them. like the Epistle of Barnabas, yeah. for example. You're talking about the apocryphal books. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would say that th there's a number of things there. Number one, the, uh, those books were, there, there, are, there are certain canon or laws gar governing the, the books. And it, when, when, the, when the church first started, <coughs> they... Because for that reason, they came up with a set of rules that govern what should be. One of the things is that in the book itself, there's evidence of inspiration. The author himself would say, these words are not my words. So, for example, the, the Institute in the Old Testament, too. Jeremiah would say, uh, and the hand of the Lord was upon me. All right, so before he spoke those things, <coughs> he helped us to see the hand of the Lord was upon him. So it wasn't his own doing. God directed it. So there is that evidence in the book. <coughs> also... The early church didn't accept those books. Those books were accepted afterwards, and there's a set of books. So those writings were come to be, to, to be included in there after, afterwards. The New Testament books are not so refuted, pretty much. But the Old Testament is. There are a lot of Old Testament apocryphal books that they'll say. But for years and years and years, the Jews, number one, never, never accepted the Apocrypha. Never did. It is translated in the Septuagint, but that, that was as a historical reference. But they were never accepted. Uh, so the Jews never said that, and they are God-ordained uh, 
they're the ones that gave us God's word. According to Romans chapter 3, they, unto them was committed the oracles of God. So if the Jews themselves didn't accept the apocryphal books as inspired, that's a very strong evidence for us that they're not to be there. Uh, so uh, the Catholic Church, I believe, was the first one to suggest that that was scripture, and it was the Council of Trent, 15, whatever it was. I believe it was the Council of Trent or Nicaea. I get those councils mixed up. But it was the Counter-Reformation Council. And so the Catholic Church assembled all of their cardinals and the Pope and all of that together, together. And the Reformation was stealing people from their church. So they were trying to get them back again. So they had this, this uh, counter council. And they decided at that point to put the apocryphal books into their Bible, which has come to be known as a Douay version of the Bible. So the Catholic Bible has them in there. They didn't have them in there prior to that time, prior to 1500. So what is the suggestion there? The suggestion is that from the time that these Old Testament books were written, which is B.C., up until 1500, we didn't have the books. They were not treated as inspired books. And so therefore, for circa 2,000 years, we didn't have God's Word. We didn't have the full counsel of God. I have a problem with that because that, that doesn't back the doctrine of preservation. See, if you understand the doctrine of preservation, then that really takes care of everything. Why are, why are the Jehovah's Witnesses because they be considered a Johnny come lately? Because they, they were 1800, right, supposedly. And so if all this doctrine came about, therefore, since the time that the New Testament was uh, finished, you know, about 100 AD, until 18-something, was it William Bradford, I think? I don't remember his name. But uh, until that time, God's truth was not given. And so I have a problem with that because we had his truth all this time. So any of those Johnny-come-lately people are, uh, can, be, can be dismissed as, as untrue. So in the New Testament Apocrypha, it would be the church. The church initially never accepted those as letters. And so they, uh, this, they, they don't satisfy the, the canon of law there. Does that, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, would that be a good argument to um, dismiss partial inspiration? Yes, well, I, again, I was just telling him, the thing I, I would say is just use God's word. Assume it is true and just use it. Use 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. All of it. All of it. What does all mean? Well, it means all. Well, and they might come back and say, well, I, I don't know if that's inspired. So they'll come back and just assume it is. Give them another verse. You know, don't. And just go right over that argument. Uh, because... Again, God's word is, is powerful. It can see through all of those things. So you just go into the argument presupposing that it's true and just use God's word. Just use it. Anything else? Okay, uh, let's talk about then the life of Christ. We're going to begin there. And, and the Lord uh, says, I think it was in John chapter 10, that uh, the not... Not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away until all be fulfilled. So these verses, um, I would use those things. And the scripture cannot be broken, he says. The Lord himself said this. And he's talking about really the Old Testament, what he's talking about. Okay, the life of Christ. Um, let's talk about his birth. He was born a virgin. Okay, that's a very, that in and of itself is obviously very distinct. Very distinct. Unparalleled not to be repeated ever again. Who had ever heard of somebody being born of a virgin? But he was. <clears throat> so, any objection to the virgin birth is an objection to the doctrine of Christ and is therefore heretical. Okay, you agree with that? That's the train of thought. Heresy is anything that goes against the doctrine of Christ. We get that from 2 John. Go to 2 John verse 9. Apparently, John was having this problem. But in 2 John 9, it says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Then he goes on to explain it. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, what doctrine? The doctrine of Christ. Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. So upon what then is are we to separate people that don't have the doctrine of Christ primarily? And this would be what heresy is. All right? So is the virgin birth part of the doctrine of Christ? It is. Remember, the, the person of Christ, the proper teaching on the person of Christ, is uh, that's, that's the difference there. All right, so the life of Christ, we, we're talking about the virgin birth. A lot of people will say that the birth, virgin birth didn't happen. What would a rationalist say? 
looking at the virgin birth, somebody that's a rationalist, what will they say? It will be there for your point. That's impossible. It's physically impossible. Mm -hmm. It is not possible. Now, I would agree with that, <laughs> unless God interrupts, unless God intervenes. So, is this supernatural? Yes, it is supernatural. Uh, beyond the natural. So a, ra a rationalist cannot uh, accept it because it doesn't make any sense. So it just, to them, it just didn't happen. <clears throat> um, some other arguments raised against the virgin birth is that the only the book of Matthew and Luke are the only ones that speak of the virgin birth. Okay, and so therefore, which again we would say so, <laughs> it is still because Matthew and, and Luke are both uh, equally inspired as Mark and John, we have to accept it as as true. But they do mention it. Uh, the the uh, Joseph and Mary, another argument, are called the parents of Christ. Well, how can Joseph be his parent? Now, remember when they were saying this, it was his hometown of Nazareth. They were the only ones, his, two, his countrymen were the other ones that mentioned that. So they were the only ones that seen him, had seen him grow up, grow up there. That doesn't mean that just because the, the people in Nazareth said that they were his parents, that that is, that is the case. So we're to take the people of Nazareth as God's word. That is historical reference. Okay, why do we believe in the virgin birth then? Why do we accept it? Because it's revealed to us clearly in the, in the Bible. Okay, Matthew chapter 1. <clears throat> These are the Christmas verses, right? I suppose, when we look at it. But maybe we forget that um, it's talking about the virgin-born Son of God. Matthew 1, 16. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now, how does this support the virgin birth? I'm going to ask you those questions. I'm going to read it again. And Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Yes? It didn't say that Joseph begat Jesus. Right. The, the phrase, of whom was born uh, Jesus, who is called Christ, is attributed to Mary only. Okay, look at verse 18, same, same chapter. <clears throat> now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before, before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. So there, verse 18 would support our understanding of what Joanna just said about 16. is before they came together. We understand that, right? So this, is, uh, this means that she was with child and hadn't come together with, John, with Joseph. Okay, so Luke 1, 34. Luke 1, 34 says, Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? All right, so she proclaims it herself. Galatians 4, 4. By the way, one of the arguments is that Paul never speaks of the virgin birth. Well, that's not true. Paul wrote Galatians, and he says in Galatians 4, 4, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, <clears throat> made of a woman, Made under the law. That's a clear reference to the virgin birth there. It's made of a woman. How can somebody be made of only a woman? Impossible. But, but that's how it was with him. What is the first time that we see the virgin birth even mentioned is Galatians, or excuse me, Genesis 3.15. It's given the fancy word to Proto-Evangelium, the first mention of the gospel. And then there it says that the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. But it says seed of a woman, specifically. So there we have a reference. In, so there, Adam and all of his descendants and all of that had the portion of God's word that would help them to understand salvation. They had Genesis 3.15. God pronounced that right there. He said that the seed of a woman. So he said that there was going to be a virgin-born Messiah that was going to come one day and ultimately uh, destroy the power of sin. And we know that's Christ, Jesus Christ in Nazareth. All right, so um, we accept it for these reasons. <clears throat> All right, so we accept it because it's given in the Bible. Uh, we accept it because it's part of Old Testament prophecy. We also accept the virgin birth because it involves the sinlessness of Christ. Because he was born only of a woman um, and not of a man, uh, then, then there, there's a, uh, it's a disruption of the nature of sin. Okay. 
Okay, had he been born like us, he would have been a sinner like us. But he wasn't born like us, therefore he's not a sinner like us. Okay, and it's very important. It's vital to our faith. Because if we don't accept that him is virgin born, then we'd have to open to the possibility that he was human born. If he's human born, then he's a sinner. If he's a sinner, we're still in our sins. Okay, so the virgin birth is very, very important. It's part of the doctrine of Christ. <clears throat> All right, so that's, that's the birth of Christ. 